everyone, and welcome to our new webinar, Let's Pack Seasonal. We're looking at the power of connected seasonal packaging, and I'm very excited to have you all here today to learn and share stories and insights on the power of seasonal packaging and the power of what that really means. So a quick few notes while some people are still coming in. This webinar is going to be recorded. It will be available on YouTube to be able to watch um, on replay, or you will be able to listen to this also through our podcast called The Talking Giraffe. This is also a live session, so do feel free to use the Q&A box, which you should be able to see um, below, or raise your hand, um, and we will try to get to your questions uh, during this live event. Finally, a quick note to also let you know that Tripti and Gander from Coca-Cola, uh, uh, the Hellenic bottling company, is not able to join us today due to um, a personal emergency. So our apologies there to the inconvenience. And of course, to Tripti, we wish her the best of luck in, in her recovery. I'm Jenny Stanley. I'm founder and managing director of Appetite Creative, and we are pioneers in the connected packaging industry. And I welcome you all to this very unique and exclusive event for packaging professionals and enthusiasts. As the global leaders in this space, we see more and more brands looking to incorporate seasonal packaging into what they do. We're looking at packaging companies and agencies who are asking us the different ways to be able to engage their audience. And seasonal packaging can make a significant impact on brands who are looking to make a strong impression. There's been so much research surrounding customer engagement and seasonal packaging in the past, that it's clear that promotional packaging is a very strong tool that resonates with customers. Well-designed seasonal packaging enables brands to be able to stand out from the rest, offer something a little uh, different, and capture the customer's eye when they're walking down that shopping aisle and capture, therefore, more market share. However, seasonal packaging is best utilised when a strategy, of course, lies behind it. How has seasonal packaging evolved? How can digital or how should digital be involved and how can you get that balance correct in ensuring that you are enhancing and advancing your brand? So if correctly executed, we know that we can get the perfect balance, but how do we do that? So with the holiday season getting closer every day, we thought that it was an excellent opportunity to provide you with some ideas, some references and some helpful information and be able to understand a little bit more around seasonal marketing and connected packaging. So this is a great way for you to engage in this um, webinar and be able to have your thoughts um, brought, to the to uh, brought to the surface as well. And ask again, as I say, any of the questions that you have to our fantastic panelists that we have here today. We know that it's a great way to engage with your consumers on a click way. So let's go now to understanding who we have with us today, because we have a group of exceptional panelists. We have um, renowned companies, Taco Bell and Duke's Hill Ham Company with us today. They are going to share some valuable insights on how their companies use holidays and seasons to promote their brands and to drive sales. Today, our session will be divided into two parts. We'll hear first from Geeta Sharam. She's Head of Marketing and Communications at Taco Bell in Malaysia. And we'll be looking at how they take advantage of the Chinese New Year and deepen their relationship with the community in Malaysia. Then we will be speaking to Emmeline Purcell. She is Marketing Manager at Dukes Hill Ham Company. And we'll be looking at how she uses technology to be able to boost the reach and engagement of seasonal packaging campaigns. I'm really excited. So sit tight. Remember to ask your questions as we go through. Um, and again, as I said to you, this will be available on YouTube or Spotify afterwards. And of course, we'd love to hear any of your feedback as well. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to our virtual stage, Gita. Gita, how are you? Oh, I'm good. very good. Oh, I'm all, all set. Yes. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for having me on this panel. Uh, excited to share my points of view and to learn new points of view as well fantastic fantastic well in true traditional fashion before we get started i do love to ask our panelists to tell us a an interesting fact that maybe not many people know about you so tell us what can you what can you reveal for us today um no it, it's it's generally a well-known fact for those who know me but um i have um uh, moved 
16 different homes uh, in my lifetime and lived on 14 in, diff- in, in 14 different countries. Um, and I think that is uh, probably the weirdest. And I would I would beg to uh, you know submit that it's uh, it's it's the best part of of, of me uh, is just the fact that I have had the fortune of being able to have hands-on experience in so many different countries and in so many different spaces. That's that's pretty impressive. You know, I've I've, I've only moved once, uh, one country. So uh, you're, you're definitely, you're definitely beating me there. Um, mm. And of course, that gives you so much more um, of a well-rounded view in terms of being able to understand things from a, from a global perspective and different cultures. So that's amazing. Yeah, I think it definitely brings a, a great deal of empathy um, when you are talking to customers, for sure. Um, but in addition, you also start seeing all the, the the pieces of the puzzle that actually link us together, um, you know, as human beings. And I think that makes uh, makes my life a lot uh, richer. And uh, when I see things happening, I, I have a, a whole suite of insights I can refer back to. Um, because having seen it somewhere else or have seen a version of it somewhere else, it just gives you a much more empathetic view, um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you, you tend to kind of be as understanding as possible as to what's going sure. on. So it just helps. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that that really leads nicely into to what you're going to be talking to us about. So you're going to be talking to us about um, a case study from uh, Malaysia for the Chinese right. New Year. So um, without further ado, I invite you yeah. to share your screen and, and tell us a little bit about that. Cool. Um, so uh, I, I apologize for the fact that it is in PDF, so you will um, be seeing the, the screen on the, on the, on the left-hand side. But that's cool. Um, so let me just take you a little bit through the thinking that, uh, uh, that, that we went through when we were when we were in the process of, of preparing to celebrate Chinese New Year this 2022. Um, it was a whole different feeling. Um, it had been two years since the community had celebrated um, Chinese New Year. Uh, and we had gone from this very vibrant, very multicultural society that celebrates all festivals into a serious lockdown. These are real pictures of us in lockdown. We had barbed wires around some communities. It was a dark time. It went on for two years. We had one of the longest um, movement control orders uh, in Asia. Um, And it was definitely a tough time for everyone um, because suddenly we went from this very vibrant nation, uh, you know, multicultural, diverse to, you know, everybody, you know, hunkering down at home. Um, So um, the idea was that uh, because we are Malaysian, uh, you know, we don't take things, we take our festivals very, very seriously. So, of course, everything moved online, Uh, you know, all of 2020, 2021. There was a lot of celebrations uh, happening online. Uh, where people were, you know, posting, uh, a lot of the communication was going on online. Um, but at the same time, it, 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 it was the first, in, in 2022, it was the first time everyone was literally stepping out into a festival, um, Chinese New Year. Uh, this happened in early February. And it, it, nobody knew what was to come. Nobody knew whether it, things were going to get better or worse. So it seemed like everybody just needed to celebrate Chinese New Year, uh, regardless of whether, you know, you were Chinese or not. Uh, it was an important, uh, uh, it was an important festival to celebrate as a people. Um, we had come out of this, you know, in one piece and we really wanted to kind of gather. Um, so though Chinese New Year Obviously, yeah, it is very much a Chinese festival. In Malaysia, we have uh, we we really do call ourselves a melting pot because our cultures are really very 
closely and intrinsically combined. The, the Islamic religion, the Chinese religion, and the Indian religion are very closely linked. And it's absolutely normal for the different people to celebrate all the festivals together, um, regardless of your uh, religious background. Um, and we felt that this was a, an amazing sort of representation of what our food is all about. Our food is Mexican inspired, uh, but it's a, a mixing of different flavors, different um, spices, uh, different textures that really create, comes together to create this very, very special um, flavor that comes with uh, Taco Bell. So, uh, you know, we felt quite strongly about the fact that instead of just allowing Chinese New Year to continue to be celebrated by the Chinese, we will call it the Lunar New Year, which is what it is. It's the new moon um, and make it an inclusive celebration that everyone can, can participate in. So not call it Chinese New Year, but really call it the Lunar New Year. That way, everyone felt invited. Um, so what we said was, uh, this Lunar New Year, it's going to be the first time that our new normal is going to be tested. We're going to you know, gather. We're going to celebrate a festival. Hasn't been done for two years. So this is, this is it. Uh, you know, this is going to be pretty big. Um, and we wanted to invite all Malaysians, regardless of race, to join this spirit of celebration. Um, and so we called it the Lunar Fiesta for All um, and really kind of raised uh, the, the, the whole um, uh, sentiment of the nation with the raising of a taco. Uh, and and it, this is not to minimize the fact that it is an amazing celebration, but the visual would speak for itself. And I'll come to the visual. Um, we were, we knew as a brand, this is what Taco Bell does. We, we are constantly disrupting conventions. So that's, that's very much at the core of what we do. When we say live cow cow, it means live more, uh, which is the brand spirit, live mass. Uh, and our target will always be the 25 year old. So that's our core target. And, uh, it's the, the, the functional benefit of this boldly disrupting convention is not calling it the Chinese New Year, but really calling it the Lunar New Year and calling everyone to come together to celebrate it and making it uh, the proposition being Taco Bell makes Malaysian celebrations inclusive for everyone. Uh, we are very big on inclusivity and diversity. And really, this was very much in line with our brand uh, profile. Um, so while we had the mass audience, uh, which was Let's take this chance to celebrate. We also needed to speak to the deal seekers because we know that, you know, with, with a QSR category, the one that we operate in, everybody's always looking for a deal. So we needed to create a, a deal uh, option. And so here is the mood board uh, that we created. It was uh, very much in Taco Bell style. Um, we used an illustrative form. We heroed our taco and lifted it in celebration of Luna, the, the Luna Fiesta. So the Luna Fiesta was, again, uh, just a celebration of this amazing festival, but in an inclusive manner. Uh, we extended this. And so that's what Jenny was talking about, is how do we go beyond uh, simply just packaging it in a normal way? We kind of hit the POSM store. We change some of the packaging uh, around uh, the, the holster and products and packs uh, that we send the takeaway. But how do we actually make it go digital? And, and, and uh, we then owned this um, uh, piece. It's a, it's a filter that we created um, on uh, IG uh, where anytime you pointed it um, uh, you know, towards uh, a scene or person or even food, it would light up and fireworks would go off and uh, that could be captured uh, as a video. And then you could post that with your little, um, you know, sign off saying happy Lunar New Year uh, or happy Lunar Celebration or happy Lunar Fiesta, uh, whatever or however you wanted to express it. But it allowed everyone to participate uh, in the celebration uh, in their own way. Um, so as you see here, uh, you know, this is the a sort of step by step of the, the actual filter that we used. Uh, and it, uh, became like a mini, 
uh, greeting that you could send to all your friends and family. Um, and uh, obviously, IG is the platform that we use um, for our Gen Z and millennial audiences. Um, so it worked really well. But then remember, we were speaking about the deal seekers. What do we do about the deal seekers? They are looking for a deal when they come in for any festival. So the uh, you know the the color red is uh, obviously the the significant color for um, for the Chinese people. It, it signifies uh, you know that that strength and and, and the, the 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 color is is one that is boldly used uh, you know throughout the festivities. We are a purple. That's our significant color and and our distinguishing brand asset. So. What we did was we actually did a quick dipstick. And the good thing is that the color purple actually works very well amongst the, the Chinese um, uh, tradition because it is the color of royalty. So we decided we will stick with the purple and we will create what we call here the Ang Tao. So the Ang Tao is a money packet. Uh, the money packet is a traditional way for the elders to actually give gifts to the younger people and definitely all the unmarried people. So the unmarried people benefit greatly during Chinese New Year. Uh, but these Angkau packets are very important part of the exchange and very important part of the festival. So we created our very own Angkau, purple Angkau, because that's our color. Um, and it became the way for people to actually express uh, their 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 excitement around the festival, and we created a taco currency. So on one side of the currency, it said 88 cents. 88 is uh, it's, it's the double infinity and a very, very lucky, lucky number uh, within the, the Chinese uh, traditions. And on the other side, the currency told you what you could get with that specific ang pao or money packet for 88 cents during the uh, redemption period. So we put up all 13 of our best selling items. And essentially you could come and as long as you spend 50 ringgit, which is approximately $10 at our, at our outlets, any of our outlets, you would get a free money packet. And the money packet would have any number, any one of a number of 13 different types of items, uh, which are our favorites on our menu and only at 88 cents. Um, so as you can see, our 13 menu items in there was extensive. 13 is not an unlucky number uh, in the tradition, uh, but 14 is. So you have to be very careful about managing these things and being aware. But uh, apart from just simply having people get their money packets, uh, if they spent at Taco Bell. We also had a little side contest running that if you scanned a code which was on the uh, currency, on our uh, Ang Pao currency, um, you could register to win what is called a Chap Gome dinner. A Chap Gome dinner happens uh, on the 10th day uh, after Chinese New Year, and it is really uh, a celebration, always a gathering. Um, and so we said that. We will be giving away five of these chapter made dinners uh, to people, and you could win uh, a table for eight people to come and dine on our uh, on Taco Bell at any one of our outlets. So uh, it it kind of really extended the whole journey all the way into actual uh, acknowledgement and reward uh, for our customers. Um, the packaging uh, of this festival then continued into the POSM material. This was the um, uh, the tent card that we had at the outlet, talking about the eighty eight cents uh, for you know uh, fabulous uh, food at Taco Bell, uh, as well as the uh, Chapcome dinner for eight, uh, which we were giving away. Um, we gave away five of these as well. Um, so ultimately, you know, it's uh, it's not just enough to be doing all of this in store. We have the the money packets, but we have to kind of take this uh, online. So um, all our communications uh, on, on social uh, captured the same visual. Uh, as you can see, the visual is really quite exciting, quite diverse. Um, and 
it really brought out the spirit of celebration, but it also made sure that it didn't look particularly uh, Chinese. So while we had people wearing Chinese outfits, it, uh, it didn't specifically call out the Chinese community. We were just always talking about the lunar fiesta, uh, creating a lot of celebration. We had, uh, you know, uh, our, our carousels that walked you through uh, how it would happen. So making sure your customers are well aware of how they can actually participate in what's going on, really dumbing it down um, so that when they see pieces of communication and they see pieces of packaging, in different places, online, on ground, in store, through POSM, that it all connects uh, and the and the, the message continuously lands uh, about the Luna Fiesta that we are celebrating. And then, of course, uh, even in the thank you messages, when people registered to participate uh, in the Chapko Made Dinner Contest, uh, that we even the, the visuals for that really continued the story and made sure that it all stuck together really uh, comprehensively. So I think that's, uh, you know, my little sort of spiel on what we did for Chinese New Year. It worked really, really well for us uh, over a period of, or over a period of a month. Uh, our sales increased by 15 plus percent. And we really felt that something like this can, can really elevate the brand, which is a very foreign brand. We have been at that time in the market for only one year. Um, we only launched in April 2021. So we've been around for less than a year. And yet we wanted to participate in this very Malaysian festival in a way that is very Taco Bell, but at the same time, very respectful of um, the, the festival itself and, and what people were feeling. As you, you know, it's really interesting. I know we talked a little bit about it. Um, before, but you know, I've I've really seen all of the detail, and it's all those different elements coming together um, that I that I see that would have brought, as you said, you know, no matter whether you're seeing that in store, whether you're seeing that on a billboard, whether you're seeing that as a digital, everything's bringing together the same um, the same message, the same look and feel, and of course, that's really important. Um, and I really love that you know that level of detail of you know investigating the color, investigating you know. What what can we do that you know emulates and matches the 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 event that we're working with, um, but also as you say, not not to offend or or mimic or anything like that, which of course is really important. Um, so there's a, obviously a, a huge level of detail in there. How how long do you think the planning was um, b b before you know? How long was that planning period before sure. uh, the event? Um, I think it always begins with a good brief. So I think the most important thing is from the brand perspective that have, have your thoughts very clear and very focused. Um, this uh, entire um, uh, campaign from beginning to end in terms of like uh, from the time we briefed the agency to the time everything was prepared because you have to also understand Printing takes time. So, you know, it's not something that you can quickly do. So whether you wanted to change the holsters, you want to change the bags, um, we actually rushed it within six weeks. Wow. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, it went fast. But as I said, if you get the brief right, right at the beginning, uh, and it's super important to have the right talent on the agency side. So you need to be working with designers, not creative. So look for designs when you're thinking of it as a holistic campaign, the designers know the rigor that must go into an integrated campaign. Um, oftentimes, when we simply just brief an agency, what happens is they come back with a great creative idea, but then we have to pull it apart to find the, the sort of common thread that we're going to have to use to link everything together. But if you go to a design agency, which is very focused on how, you know, an integrated campaign works, they immediately start developing the elements that you're going to need. So the masthead, the colors, the, 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 the way you're going to use, as you saw here, there were, you know, uh, illustrations that we were using. So the illustrations had to be very iconic, you know, in a, in a way they had to be a style to the illustrations. Um, 
just if you were going to use any kind of a, um, uh, you don't want to use a flat color. You want to put some some uh, pattern into it to kind of dimensionalize it a bit. So again, having the ability to, to use the right kind of um, uh, pattern that won't interfere with the visuals. So there's a lot of detail that comes in design uh, and we worked very closely. Uh, so in fact, our brief specifically spoke to a lot of the design elements that we needed to see. Um, and most of us have those design elements. They exist in our toolkits and our brand toolkits. Uh, we just need to make sure that the agency is aware and very clearly focused on, on those elements. Yeah, no, absolutely. There was, there was the really nice part, which of course is a, as a digital agency, uh, stuck in my mind, which of course is the, the, the Instagram filter, which, which you talked about. How, yeah. how did you get the idea from that? And how was the interaction? How was that received? Right. Um, so, you know, I think the Instagram filter is now, it, it, it's just got to be standard in almost every campaign we do, uh, because it's the one that has the strongest hook, uh, amongst our, our Gen Z and millennial, um, fans. Uh, it, it's it's there. It's it's sort of the elevated expression that goes beyond an emoji. Uh, you know, perhaps the previous generation, the emoji was just uh, you know the the strong way that you would express uh, what you felt. Now it's a filter. So what happens is that if if you would see if you take a look at the filter, we didn't go excessive on the branding on mm -hmm. the filter, right? So keep. If, if you're going to ask them to use it as a way to express uh, a sentiment or a feeling during any kind of festival, don't overly brand it because it, it, it comes across as, as then uh, disingenuous. Uh, so keep the branding minimal. Use small uh, key things, maybe just, you know, for us, just the bell, uh, used very choicefully. Um, it's, it's really to get that engagement. That's what we're asking for is, is get engaged in this. Our big idea is about the lunar celebration or the lunar fiesta. That has to be key. And because they'll be seeing us, our presence in so many other different places, it will connect. The dots will connect. So it's not as critical uh, as, you know, in the, in, in the old days when you used to do a TV commercial and you had to kind of do branding, branding, branding. And, you know, it's 75% of the, 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 the screen must have my brand in the final. Uh, you know, uh, the, the final frame, uh, we, we are now moving into a place where uh, young people are actually re rejecting overtly commercial uh, pieces. So uh, we, we have to be very sensitive, uh, still obviously make sure that the brand presence is there, but do it in a way that is subtle not, and definitely aesthetic because these guys will not just take, you know, any old stuff. It, you really have to make sure it's aesthetically pleasing because they have a very strong sense of aesthetics. And I think that those are challenges, uh, yeah, which which I think are very exciting in this uh, for this this whole Gen Z that we're working with right now. Uh, I absolutely agree, and I think that's one of the challenges um, that, that as a as a design agency we often try to say. I know that you want to have your brand there. I know that you want to have your logo in every single tiny you know crook and cranny. But you, you have to also remember that, you know, it is a changing audience, especially if you want your audience to share something, which is, you know, the optimum idea for the Instagram filter. If you want them to share, it's got to be something that they think looks good and isn't massively promoting the brand overtly because people won't share it. You know, I often say, is that something you would share? <laughs> uh, oh, no, no, well, no. So it's it's absolutely that. So some really, really um, points that kind of resonate there. Out of all the different parts of the um, campaign that you talked about, um, was there any one particular part that, that did better than everything else? Right. Um, I, I think um, the the Angkau packets that we created, the money packets, um, because we ran the, the campaign for, uh, for a month, um, initially it took some time to pick up. So, you know, in the first week or so, people were still just getting used to this idea that we were just giving away these packets. Uh, you know, it's, it's very unusual that a brand just gives it away in the way that, 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 that we were. But as it started to pick up steam and we came into week two and three, 
then people, we realize people are actually sharing it with each other to say, hey, you know, I got this, this money packet or this unpow at, at Taco Bell and, and I got, you know, a, and the items we were giving for free uh, or for 88 cents, which is literally free, yeah. are very big and expensive ticket items on the menu. So something that would cost, a, you know, around 17, 16 or 17 ringgit which is uh, approximately, say, um, three or four U.S. dollars, you were getting for 88 cents, which is like less than uh, 88 divided by four would be about 20 cents. Yeah. Um, you know, so so it, it, the, the word started to get around. So apart from us, of course, putting out the word, having all the POSM, it, it actually became something that the community started to share with each other. Mm. And so we saw a lot of that happening uh, on our social media. Um, so it started to blow up on our social media. So by week three and four is when we saw sort of the really big, um, you know, sort of push. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's really important to keep a very close ear to the ground uh, about how these things work. Now, I'm sure that the next question that you have is what didn't work so well. You know, I think it's oh my. Really... <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I think oh that's, my. you know, yeah. I, I mean, you're always so happy about stuff that works, right? It's, it's, it's got to be the stuff that doesn't work that we, you really need to take into account. So it actually goes back to the same um, uh, Angkau is as much as it worked, we felt that perhaps the value that, you know, the, the minimum order value that we had pegged may have been a little too high. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Can you uh, actually share your screen again? Um, Mart is just asking to see some of the, the um, images of the, of the money oh, packets. Yes, sure. Give me a second. I will just get yeah, this. That'd be amazing. No worries. And so, yeah, just to, to, to not let you lose your thread there as well, you were talking about perhaps at the minimum order that you okay. had um yeah that's great thank you so the minimum order you thought was maybe a little bit too high maybe a bit too high um uh primarily i think it was not because it was too high in in sort of absolute terms but because people were just coming out of the pandemic um that their spending power may not have been as much mm. um you know as it would be uh, you know under normal circumstances so uh, uh, I think maybe having taken that and, and, and sort of factored that into our sensibilities, perhaps we could have uh, come in at a lower price point, which we did for our subsequent offer that we did for Ramadan. So uh, Ramadan was the next big festival that we uh, celebrated. And um, in that, we, we actually gave away uh, uh, the, the packets for free. But of course, the packets were a very different kind. It was basically about more about giving. Uh, so whenever you bought something, we would give to charity right. and it was called gifts of gratitude. Um, so uh, we did that very differently and then we've continued to do that. So uh, each one is a learning. We also feel that um, for the filter, that perhaps the, the, the I think the um, technology is getting better uh, with the filters. Let me see if I can find you uh, my filter. Um, yeah. So uh, I think as technology improves, I think our filters will improve. It's it's hard sometimes to get the aesthetics right yeah. uh, on a filter. I mean, it looks like a lot of fun and it is a lot of fun, uh, but to really make it, you know, something truly exciting uh, could, could take a lot more time and development and maybe a lot more expensive. So I think that's something that we need to take into account and uh, perhaps give ourselves a little bit more lead time. Um, yeah. I yeah. mean, the lead time that you have was, was pretty short for, for us. Yes. <laughs> we, yeah, very, I mean, you said six weeks, right? So yep. for us, when we're creating um, a little bit more kind of intricate uh, in, uh, Instagram filters or augmented reality filters or, or things like that, we, we're normally looking at the kind of 10 uh 10 11 weeks 12 weeks for, for that absolutely season. super sure yeah. yeah well you have to also remember that uh you know for us because we were a new brand and we're technically a startup at the time that we were celebrating chinese new year we only had five outlets 
Okay. Um, and and of course now we are at fourteen and, and growing. So um, we uh, we were still at a relatively small scale to be able to do things uh, you know relatively quickly because it was only a, a limited number of outlets. But as we are growing and expanding, and and of course you know having outlets in in far flung places or you know Ipoh, Penang, Johor. Uh, as outlets are coming up in other places around the country, we're definitely going to need at least a three-month lead time in mm. order to better prepare uh, because it's not just production, but also transportation, logistics, training. Um, all of these things require training. So we have to train the staff. So mm. we we did our training online. Um, so we had set up a virtual training and we actually walked them through all the materials step by step. This is what this looks like. This is what this looks like. This is what you're going to get to see. This is how you have to scan it. Um, showed them shots of the the the, the pass, the point of sale mm-hmm. piece. This is how you scan it. So you really have to spend that time if you're going to do something where you're going to kind of transform the brand at a packaging level. It's got to come all the way through, and of course, in a QSR, that all the way through includes the the crew behind the, the counter that's taking the message. Um, we yeah. have to, you know, we have to include them as part of our packaging piece. Yeah. Um, so Absolutely. I think, you know, so uh, when when we went to the design agency, we actually got them to give us a script uh, that would go to the cashier at the counter, FAQs, all of that, having all of that ready. Um, so they could tell people like, what is this Luna Fiesta? Why are we doing this? What does it mean? You know, things that perhaps they're not going to have ready answers to. So you yeah. have to, you know, complete the journey. And, and prepare for that. Yeah, absolutely. One more question from, from the audience. Um, did you do a customer survey afterwards to get any reactions from, from your consumers? Uh, again, I think, uh, you know, because we are so small, we can actually track a lot of things on our uh, uh, on our pages. Uh, we have an in-house community management a management team that uh, tracks uh, everything. We respond. We have uh, pretty much a hundred percent response rate uh, to everything that we see from the community. So uh, we didn't do a, um, a sort of syndicated uh, research, uh, but we also do subscribe to YouGov. And to NetBase, uh, so we did keep our ears to the ground using those two platforms uh, to figure out what was the uh, medium term um, uh, sort of impact, not just during the time of the actual event itself, uh, the one month, but also beyond that. And we saw that we had great lift for the sales uh, all the way up to three months uh, after uh, this. But of course, understand that. We also had Raya Ramadan coming pretty soon after, so it was kind of a compounded effect. Yeah. But um, uh, it was it, it was significant enough for us to notice a difference uh, on these two platforms for sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's really a fantastic campaign. What have you got coming up next? Okay, so we're getting ready for. Um, we just finished uh, as of yesterday. So some of you, no, none of you are in yesterday. So. Uh, yesterday was National Taco Day. Uh, so yeah. the 4th of October is National Taco Day all over the world. Uh, some of you may have seen the campaigns in your respective countries if you have a Taco Bell there. Uh, and essentially, it was a taco tag campaign. Uh, we asked people uh, to, we had a little video uh, uh, announcing Happy National Taco Day to everyone and to ask people to taco tag their friends and let them know each country had its own um, promo going on. Uh, we gave away free tacos on Monday and Tuesday wow. for anybody who registered with us. So we had a big, big campaign that just finished yesterday. So, Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Well, thank you so much, Gitar. It's been really, really um, interesting. I think you shared so many different insights there and everything from... Uh, the planning to actually the the um, activation down to training the people um, in store or at the retail outlets, which of course is really, really important as well. So I've learned a lot. I'm sure the audience have learned a lot. Um, we we would love, obviously, to pass on any other questions that we might get to you. Um, and thank you very much for your time. And of course, I'd love to keep in touch. Cool. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Gita. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Ciao.
Thank you. So without further ado, we're going to move to the second part of our um, webinar today. So we're looking at the power of technology on seasonal marketing campaigns. And joining me now, I have the pleasure to invite Emmeline Purcell, who is Marketing Director at Dukes Hill Ham Company, to our virtual stage. Hello, how are you? Hi. Yeah, welcome. Um, thanks for the welcome. Um, yeah, I'm really good, thank you. We're just in the middle of our Christmas campaign kickoff, so it's uh, busy times for us here. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. In true <laughs> traditional fashion, before we get started into the nitty gritty questions, um, can you tell us an interesting fact about yourself? Yeah, I was uh, trying to think of one that was seasonally relevant. So, oh. um, yeah, I <laughs> I uh, was part of the team that actually launched the first ever Cadbury Christmas TV ad campaign. Um, so it's quite a big deal um, back you know, just years ago now. But um, yeah, big, big deal for, for us. And a lot of people thought that um, it was, it was you know, a surprise Cadbury. Surely they've been on TV before at Christmas, but actually they hadn't. So it was, yeah, a huge, huge campaign and a huge privilege to be part of. When when was that? What year was that? Uh, that was back in oh, 2015 or, yeah, 2015 or even before that, actually. Uh, 2000 might have be been 2014. Right? That's how long ago it was. <laughs> around that time. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I would yeah, have thought that yeah. they would have been on, on, on TV before around Christmas time yeah. before then. Yeah, I think the perception has probably been because you're so used to seeing Cadbury products at Christmas in store, there's mm. already that sort of visibility and recognition sort of there and that latent sort of recognition. But yeah, we'd never been on TV before back in the day. So um, yeah, it's a huge, huge uh, privilege to be part of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, well, you know, we, we, we can start there because obviously you, you, you've worked at Cadbury's, you're currently working at Dukes Hill Ham Company, um, you know, Cadbury's is very much a, a mass market brand, um, whereas Duke's Hill is much more of a kind of luxury uh, positioned product. Um, how do you think that differs in terms of seasonality campaigns, the planning, the possibilities? Um, what do you see as the kind of main differences there? Uh, yeah, I guess just to give I guess a bit of background about Duke's Hill, we're an um, online artisan fine food company. So predominantly, uh, well, it, the business is fully direct to consumer. So I guess versus something like Cadbury, that um, very much a mainstream brand, very much uh, reliant on um, that physical in-store presence and packaging and innovation plays a really key role in terms of signposting the category for consumers in store and for retailers. Versus uh, for us here at Duke's Hill. You know, our website is our shop window. So almost that customer journey is a little bit reversed because before somebody gets to our packaging and our experience with our product, obviously there's a number of layers that we go through. So email is a huge, plays a huge role for us as well as sort of direct mail. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the, the main differences I see really. Um, so is, uh, Cadbury's kind of, looking at four or five different um, seasonal areas, maybe due to only looking at Christmas, would you say? Or uh, Well, I, I mean, obviously the, the sort of scale that Cadbury, Cadbury is, it's got, you know, huge, huge apartments. So uh, my role back, back then was I was responsible for the Christmas and Halloween portfolio. So a lot of people would say, oh, okay, you only work on Christmas. So, you know, you only work a few months of the year. Well, <laughs> actually, no, every day was Christmas for, for me and for, for the team. Uh, so that was very much, um, you know, specific team dedication and focus on on Christmas. But they're also obviously Easter is also another big seasonal occasion for confectionery as well. And again, a whole team devoted to that. Whereas now at Duke's Hill, actually Christmas is, again is still a big big part of our of our business. You know, probably over half of our business is actually in in December. So it really does ramp up then. But actually, we look at other other season opportunities. So my role now is actually sort of more broader than just Christmas and actually identifying what other seasonal moments uh, throughout the year can we start to, to build our presence in. So things like Easter yeah, is another sort of second big spike. Uh, also things like Valentine's Day, Thanksgiving is, is another big opportunity for us as well. So we're sort of identifying which of those seasonal moments that have, we have a right to and credibility to, to sort of play in. Yes, um, and I think that's a really good point as well. And I think Gita was 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 talking about the uh, credibility part as well, and not just kind of coming in and trampling over and uh, people's cultural, um, religious uh, celebrations, especially, or indeed just kind of hanging on to something and um, ending up being a little bit disingenuous. So uh, I, I fully agree there. 
Yeah, one one thing for us, I guess, Thanksgiving is um, obviously it's quite a traditional American uh, occasion, but I think it's becoming more popular in the UK and almost uh, consumers and customers are sort of finding ways to celebrate and you know for friendships and come to and find and come together and sort of celebrate those moments. So that's something for us that we will need to be sensitive and mindful about how we communicate and position. You know, we're a traditionally British brand, so it's just finding the right balance of how you sort of talk about that. But it's definitely a big occasion, a seasonal moment that is is, is worth for us. You know, we have a range of fabulous turkeys, so why not um, sell them at Thanksgiving as well as Christmas? Uh, absolutely, and I think as well as as the world becomes smaller, as as you have people living in you know any any country, um, I think as well it becomes more open that you might not necessarily be a first generation American, so to speak, um, mm-hmm. but yet still uh, celebrate with your family who may still be in America and you may have moved. So you know I can see that there's big communities now. Um, whereas before I think we were much more segregated in, in, in where people lived and that's changing. Another thing that's changing is technology. Um, and I think technology very much has brought forward the opportunity for, for seasonal marketing. Digital in particular means that you can turn things around very quickly. Um, we were kind of talking about, you know, a couple of weeks to be able to pull things together um, in the previous uh, panel. But how do you find technology innovation um, affecting the, the seasonal marketing campaigns that you're doing? Yeah, for, for us, um, we've been quite a traditional business at Dukes Hill, very much reliant on direct mail. So we're actually on quite a transformational um, uh, phase in terms of improving our digital and e-commerce experience. So actually a lot of fundamental things for us around, you know, data and analytics and how uh, much more sophisticated our segmentation and targeting capabilities are, particularly for emails. And giving us that ability to identify which customers might be uh, the right fit for certain seasonal opportunities. So that's a huge, you know, these are sort of, you know, fundamentals for us in terms of setting up the the business and making sure that we're as efficient and effective as possible. So that's kind of one area for us. The other part is, I guess, a lot around personalization and making sure that that user experience is is more, more relevant. So, I mean, certainly in, in my cabri days as well, we used to use uh, personalization a lot to, to enhance that gifting experience. So that was in the days where you can still do this now online, but you could go online and um, order a cabri bar of chocolate and personalize your name and with a gift message and then get that sent to you. And then we looked at also how we could recreate that in stores to bring that sort of online and offline experience together. That's probably another part in terms of technology innovation and how we're sort of trying to bring those two worlds together and particularly connect our sort of offline physical brochure direct mail experience with our um, online experience as well so uh, you know there's great uh, technology in terms of ar qr code so those are the types of things that you're kind of doing to bring the physical and the digital uh, world together yeah so some of the things that we've just been implementing uh, here to improve that experience um is so obviously, like I said, we're direct to consumer base. So the first experience, you know, the first experience um, is our is our a lot of it is our website. And actually, when when our de- de- delivery boxes arrive and, and you get all that wonderful, fantastic food, it's how do we sort of keep that that digital experience and keep sharing it on? So some of the things we've just implemented is improving our delivery box. So making sure that that's really well branded and is that, that real wow factor, so that when it lands. You know, it almost it just reinforces the quality and the credentials of our, you know, we're such a premium luxury brand. We've added now QR codes to our delivery box packaging. There's two elements to it. One is for uh, social sharing. So uh, encouraging customers to share their experience and share the wonderful food. And again, that just sort of um, brings that offline and online experience and helps us to just kind of promote and get more people to become aware of us. You know, we're still relatively small brand, low awareness, almost startup like, even though we've been around for 35 years. Uh, and our customer base is very much traditional, older uh, customers. And we're trying to bring in a younger audience. So we know that social sharing uh, works really well for us. And we, we do a lot of work with influencers uh, who share the co- hamper content and, and food. So just trying to get that cycle going of sharing uh, online. Uh, the other part, which is really kind of critical for us as well, is um, we've added QR codes to drive directly to Trustpilot for capturing reviews. Mm-hmm. We we have a 4.7 star rating, which is exceptional. So we're very proud of that. But um, And also th- those reviews really help in terms of customer acquisition. 
you know, we utilize that information in our email campaigns, uh, in our direct mail campaigns, because, of, you know, word of mouth is still one of the most powerful tools. So if we can use somebody else's review or comment to help advocate our products, then um, that's just going to help us uh, sell, particularly in those seasonal periods when, you know, we are more expensive. So, you know, we need to make sure that we're giving people those reasons to why and, you know, supporting why, why they should why they should spend a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of building on those those trends. And I think at the moment, um, the trend is, of course, being able to take a recommendation uh, from a trust pilot or an online review. But but also, you know, talking again to to Gita's point before, like those kind of millennials and, and the younger audience who are using Instagram, who are looking at social sharing. So, you know, being able to create uh, content that people will want to be able to share also, of course, opens up your, your audience. So there's lots of great ways there that you're kind of bringing in technology. Um, do you think um, that smart technology is going to further? Um, you know, have you got more plans to be able to do more with, with QR codes or smart technologies? Yes, definitely. Like I said, we're still um, on a very early journey for us. I think one of the other things that we, like I said, wanting to connect more about is our direct mail um, uh, sort of marketing channel is hugely effective for us. That's kind of how the business was built. But again, you know, we want ultimately we want to get people onto our website and almost have that online experience with us. So you know, we send out direct mail catalogs, you know, quite frequently. Um, and we're looking at well, we're adding now how to be add QR codes to get people onto the website and particularly draw their attention to specific content. So we recently conducted a customer survey to understand what do people want to hear more about from us, what products do they like to hear and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that came up was recipe content. People really loved the recipe content that we that we you know sometimes would share. We often had one in the brochure and they wanted more. So you know we've got lots of lovely content already there that actually you know we're not we need to push push people to that and sort of draw their attention to yeah and so that it's not just sitting there sort of waiting for someone to find so that's you know it's really they're just really simple ways that you can use technology to to connect that offline experience um, and bring people online and and share more content really uh so yeah that's that's definitely just one one example i guess of, of what we're looking to do fantastic We've got uh, a question uh, from the audience. Um, you are an online brand. Why do you want, only want to stay in the digital uh, landscape and not open a physical location? Uh, I guess it's just uh, the, the stage that the business is at at the moment and the, and the set, set up and the structure. Uh, obviously, that's, a, you know, having physical stores obviously adds operational, huge operational costs for us as well. Uh, and can actually probably limit our focus and, and reach. So, I mean, I guess it's not ruled out, but um, yeah, it's not not something that we'd be looking at today. It's, it's hard to compete with uh, those costs of running a physical store. Absolutely. Going back to what you were talking about in terms of um, the, the the planning period. Obviously, when you were at Cadbury's, that was your that was your job. So, literally, as you said, <laughs> Christmas was every day, which. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. That's a, that's a <laughs> yeah. But how long is the is is the planning period at the moment for for, for you at uh, Jigs Hill? Uh, oh, I mean that we it, it sort of is throughout the, throughout the year really. It never stops, but I mean it really does ramp up sort of from at least from sort of July onwards. Um, from a production point of view, we have to start scaling up and forecasting orders. So. In order to do that, we need to understand well what marketing channels are we going to um, be activating across? What's our spend levels? What level of traffic do we expect? Um, even looking at previous email campaigns to understand, um, you know, things like open rates, click rates, order rates, all of that kind of stuff to get a sense of volume. Like we need to feed all of that in to to be able to start producing products. So. I say that could start from July, but often, you know, those conversations are going on throughout the year. But obviously, they just they do really ramp up from about now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. On, I mean, back on. in back in uh, sort of uh, when I was at Cadbury, actually, our lead times were even longer for that. So we would be selling in Christmas in the January uh, to our sales team ready for for going live sort of in that year. And then wow. obviously, if you work if you work back from that, you know, to present to your sales team, these are the products we're launching. You've got all those lead times of packaging and product um, development 
in there. So, I mean, some things could be 12 months. Um, I know Peter was talking about six week lead times and turnarounds. You know, yeah. we, we, we did pull a lot of things out of the bag to get things through quickly. But I mean, even that is still, you're still working a year, a year out, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really interesting just thinking about that cycle. Um, and then the planning that needs to come behind that to make sure that you are ready because it's not about going live on Christmas as a Christmas campaign. So you need to be ready before and, and of course, work back from that. A couple of, couple of questions now from the audience as well. Ahmad says, uh, thanks for the great webinar. So thanks, thanks very much to you too. Um, how is the digital printing technology fitting into your marketing campaigns? Uh, so say that again. What? Yeah, so how is digital printing uh, fitting into your marketing campaign so is there anything uh, that you're changing you've got the QR codes are they all uh, digitally printed are they all the same QR um, not really sure any other I'm trying to help that yeah question so I mean I guess I mean if I'm understanding the question uh, the digital printing that we do in terms of brochures and catalogs that um, we we go out um, we've got quite a um, sort of very solid plan in terms of how the frequency of how we send send those through uh, at the moment, we've, we're adding QR codes onto those brochures to just, like I said, connect connect that those experiences together. Uh, and then again, we also then um, upload that content digitally uh, as well. So you've got a sort of digital version of those those that experience. A question from I don't you. know if I answered that. <laughs> I'm not sure, but Ahmad, if you feel that's not the right um, answer, please please ask us more. Um, Vince also asks, um, do you find uh, what you do is governed or restricted by your customer demographic. I know you said before that was traditionally quite an older audience. Um, are the behaviours of the demographic changing to be more accepting of digital solutions? Yeah, that's a, a really, a really good question, actually, because, like I said, our customer base is, is much older, uh, very affluent, um, and you, you'd sort of assume maybe they're not as there's an assumption they might be not as digitally savvy but i actually think that's probably um not quite correct um we can see from our analytics that the devices that our customers are you know searching our web placing orders looking at our emails it's predominantly mobile which is i guess consistent with with you know broader other age ranges as well so i think we we do have to be sort of mindful that we don't put too much um over technology um or too many fad or too many trendy things um mm. for them so for example like we wouldn't start promoting tiktok to our customer base because it's just not the right platform for them so you definitely do we definitely do need to be have one eye on our existing core customer base and that we're not doing anything that sort of alienates them or makes mm. them feel uncomfortable but equally, we you know we've got huge growth ambitions, and we're looking to broaden our audience and our reach. So it's just being selective in the channels, and then how you we use digital in those channels um, as well, um, and sort of try and balance it that way. Absolutely, and I think there is that massive misconception. Maybe twenty years ago, you could say mm -hmm. the older audience weren't necessarily interacting with technology, but I think you know the the people who were 40, uh, 20 years ago now are obviously 60. And, and of course, that that changes. And if you say you're, you're finding the larger proportion of your audience on mobile, um, we know as well that from, from our studies that um, the, well, main studies is that, you know, tablets are, are mostly held uh, by the majority of people who are over 50. So, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're the people who own tablets and QR codes uh, are scanned every week by the over 50s. So again, mm -hmm. you know, it's I think an old conception, and if you're seeing that as well, you're probably. It's seeing so much easier. It's so much easier for now as well. Just the way that QR codes, you know, you don't even have to, you know, before you used to download apps, and that was obviously too many steps for for older customers to get their head around potentially. Whereas yeah. it's so easy now. You just open up your camera and scan it, and it's sort of it's quite an, an intuitive and and learned, I guess, behaviour now that I think a lot of people are sort of, um, you know, quite comfortable with. Yeah, and then and then there's that mass adoption, and I think COVID um, was was probably mm -hmm. a good driver for that. You know, the mass adoption meaning that you know if you want to go to a, a bar or a restaurant and see the menu, and normally now yeah. instead of handing you a menu, they're going to give you a QR code. So you've got to, yeah. you know, you've got to scan to be able to eat. So <laughs> that means that you, <laughs> you know you've actually got that technology moving forward into to all different demographics. Um, we're coming, we're coming to the end. What, what would you say are your kind of top three tips 
um, for people who are looking at, at seasonal campaign planning. What are you, you know, you've been doing this a while. What are your top three magic? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. So, I mean, the first one is just no brainer is just plan ahead. So, Chris, no, for example, Christmas is the same day every year. You know when it's coming. So, you've got, there's no excuse to sort of start thinking about it and start those conversations early. And even just mapping out any season, when, you know, when are those seasonal moments? You know when they are, actually plan ahead and work back from from those um, because, you know, there's a, you can't just turn it on overnight. There's a lot of rigor in terms of understanding, using the data to understand previous performance, understanding your audience segmentation, all of those things to just go into, you know, building a really solid plan. Um, the second one is probably around the creative um, um, and sort of staying true to who your customers are and knowing your brand. So don't let the season dictate how you show up as, from a brand point of view. It needs to feel relevant still that it's coming coming from you. Otherwise, it just sort of, it just really jars. So example like Cap- Cadbury, you know, we took the, the assets that consumers knew and love, you know, the purple, the iconic logo, and then we just gave that a festive twist. Um, mm-hmm. using sort of, knit, knit, sort of a knit pattern. So it's just sort of using those festive assets and elements to, but still in keeping with your brand. And then here at Duke's Hill, you know, we've created a festive style guide for all of our agencies, which is in keeping with our brand. It still remains sort of premium luxury, but it, it's, it sort of gives clear guidance on the types of festive illustrations that we might use or the festive decorative elements so that we're, we're still in keeping with all of that. You know, you, we wouldn't go, you know, overtly Christmas, like maybe what, like a, I don't know, like a, a, a Lidl or another mainstream or sort of discount a supermarket would do. It still has to be at that high end. So that's definitely something that you just, um, I think is, is, it's easy to get carried away with. Um, and then the final, the final one for me, maybe not as sexy, but absolutely fundamental to the success of any seasonal campaign, especially where you're selling a product, um, is just, you know, really communication with other departments. So whether that's sales teams or particularly production. So whether you're even with, even if you're just updating existing product with seasonal packaging, or if you're creating a bespoke seasonal product, making sure that you're working with other, other departments to stay close to the stock levels on all of that is just fundamental. Like it might be a good problem to, to sell out, but if you're, if you can't produce more product, um, then you're just missing out on sales opportunities. So a couple of examples um, for that, I think one example from us at Duke's Hill last year, we ran out certain products, but we had still ad spend driving traffic to the website and had to stop it. So again, we're missing sales opportunities uh, are there to, to own the season. And then even at Cadbury, I had to work very closely with our production team, sales team, when we were sort of forecasting how many chocolate um, roses, Cadbury roses or Cadbury heroes tubs we're going to sell. Because you don't want to be in a position where at the end of the season, you're left with all this stock and you've got to discount it because it just devalues your, your brand. So it's just really key to just make sure that your business operations and that commercial aspect working with other departments and you're not in, not in a silo. Yeah. No, that makes makes perfect sense. Some really really good tips there. We did just get one quick question in, um, so maybe we can just get that in before we before we close up. Um, the question is, what social media is the uh, one you rely on most um, for for new customers or to find new customers? Uh, it tends to be Instagram and and Facebook. Really, obviously, they're sort of the biggest reach, uh, and those are the ones that um, yeah, Facebook's news older, Instagram slightly younger. I guess it's quite similar to. The, to the sort of main demographics for those. So those are the main ones. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing such fantastic <laughs> insights. Really good to, to to learn so many different things that I hadn't really thought about. Um, although I think if I was working at Cadbury's, I wouldn't mind so much if this stock was left behind if they let us take it home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, is, there is only so much chocolate you can eat having, having lived through it. <laughs> That's probably true. That's probably true. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, and again, if we get any more questions, I'd love to pass them on. And of course, love to, love to keep in touch. So a big thank you to both of our, our panellists today. Fantastic. Uh, insights from Gita from Taco Bell, Malaysia, and from Emmeline Prodicel uh, from Dukes Hill um, from the UK. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you to our wonderful audience and to your fantastic questions today as well. So that concludes our very special webinar, which was looking at packing seasonal and the power of connected seasonal packaging. Big thank you to our panelists. Big thank you to all of you who took your time uh, for your questions and for listening in. Don't forget that the webinar will be available very soon, available very soon on YouTube and on our social media. 
and we'd love to hear any feedback or any questions and we can pass them on to our panelists. Have a fantastic rest of the day and we look forward to seeing you at our next one.